Travis, you want to go first? Sure, I can show some. All right. Okay, you see my screen? Yeah. This is a, unfortunately all I have is a, is a, is a single AP view here, but I think this is a nice differential case. And there's one finding in particular that I like on this radiograph. So this is a woman who is 22. And as you can see, there's this mass just to the right of midline. And you can see that there's a hilum overlay sign. So, you know, it's either anterior or posterior, we see preserved right heart border, and you can even see a little mock band there. So it tells you it's probably more posterior. What I really like though is this right here, which I, when I was looking at this, because I just, this is an outside radiograph, but you can see that indicates there's probably some level of chronicity of this because it kind of bevels out the ribs or the, the vertebral bodies right there. So it's posterior mediastinal, unilateral, so you're thinking probably nerve sheath tumor. And you can see on the on the radiograph here, or on the CT, that that it's a well circumscribed mass heterogeneous attenuation. There's probably a small effusion adjacent to it, uh, but they took this out, and this did turn out to be a schwannoma. But I like the little the little beveling of the of the vertebral bodies right there, just indicating it's probably been there for quite a while. I guess fibrous tumor, the pleura maybe, but she's pretty young. So good look for a nerve sheath tumor, which is what this turned out to be. So, and I guess she presented with just back pain at 36 weeks. So it sounds like it was a incidental OMA. Wow, that was a good observation. That was really subtle, but that's really interesting. Yeah, it was I fun. Mean, I mean, this was yeah. all outside. I just saw this at the tumor board, but it was fun to go back and look at that and see that there, so. Hey, question for you guys. When you guys see a paraspinal mass, um, do you typically do a CT or do you sometimes just go right to MR given the high likelihood it's going to be neurogenic? That's a good question. I think we just generally go to CT just because it's quicker and okay. faster. And this was all done outside. For sure. And yeah, and they're going to take it out anyway. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know, Howard, what do you guys do? Um, my guess is that it would be reasonable to do an MR. So I suppose if the person happened to be seeing a, a spine person or a neurosurgeon first and they ordered an MR, that would be reasonable. So, yeah, I don't have strong feelings. I think either would be okay, right? Once you've decided that's what it likely is. Yeah, I guess if you're going to evaluate a likely neurogenic tumor with MR would be just fine. Yeah. The smaller ones we tend to, if it's one that may not be surgical, we may just go to MR and say it's, you know, it's a nerve sheath tumor or whatever and be done with it. But I was just curious. Yeah. Okay. So this is an interesting case. This lady had, um, she had a few different abdomen and pelvis CTs at different times and chest CTs. And so she had these, these pelvic lesions here that you see, and they're, they're mostly low attenuation, a little bit of, of enhancement to them. And you can see some along the internal iliac chain and external iliac chain here as well. And so they excised one of these. And I don't know the exact temporal relationship of all this, but they excised one of these and it was a lymphangioliomyoma histopathologically. And you can see her kidneys look okay, but when you look at her lungs that she was noted to have a bunch of little cysts, uniform, well-circumscribed, smooth wall or thin walled cysts that are spherical. So that did prompt a CT of her chest and prompted several CTs of her chest. And I'll show a, I'll show this one. So certainly this looks like lamb. And it's a, it's a good look for lamb, which is what this lady has. It goes with her lymphangioliomyomas of her, of her retroperitoneum. But what was interesting was this was done outside and this was called likely a lymphangio, lymphangioma or lymphangioliomyoma of her anterior mediastinum. And this was at the outside hospital. I think they had a little bit of anchoring bias based on knowing the prior pathology. And when she came to us and for referral at our ILD conference, that I was quickly saying, I'm not so convinced of that. This certainly doesn't look like a lymphangioma, lymphangioma or lymphangioliomyoma. It's too solid. And it was getting bigger. And so 
they actually took this to surgery or they did a biopsy and they're going to take it out. But this turned out to be a thiamoma in her anterior mediastinum. So just, you know, you know, just a collision of two different diseases. Cause I, I don't know of any relationship between lamb and thymomas, but it's a good example of lamb with just a few thin walled spherical cysts. And then the, I like the lymphangiomas in the retroperitoneum just cause we often, you know, I don't often see those. And then this big anterior mediastinal lobulated mass. So just going through the anterior mediastinal mass differential, certainly thinking thymic neoplasm or maybe lymphoma in an adult would be the most likely things, but this turned out to be uh, just a, a thymoma. But these are kind of cool. I don't know, have you ever seen these anywhere else? Have you ever seen like these types of lymphangiomyomas in the mediastinum or elsewhere? Because I know they can occur in other locations. We just don't rare, we don't see them often. No, I've seen I think a, I've seen one case in my career of a mediastinal presumed lymphangiomyoma. Yeah. Okay. I've seen them in the upper retroperitoneum on chest CTs in patients with lamb and tuber sclerosis. So along the aorta, periaortic yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. There's probably some small ones here too, but yeah, I guess that's not, that's one thing that we just so infrequently encounter. I don't think to look for those as much as I think to look for, you know, the AMLs and the kidneys and the fatty foci in the heart, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. all right, let's see. This is just a quick one. This was a patient at the VA. And Howard, you'll like this one. This guy underwent a cath because he was having chest pain or something. And they had trouble engaging his, his right coronary artery. And this is post-cath. They know they did something. And you can see here that this is a non-contrast study. And we have a lot of iodinated contrast in the pericardial space. So they, they know that they, they punctured his RCA and injected a bunch of contrast into the pericardium. What I think is really cool about this is the fact that you can see contrast accumulating along our shared adventitial space in the, in the pulmonary artery. And it's like it's basically intramural contrast along the ascending aorta. And then there is a, a post con here where you can just see the same thing, but it's a, it's impressive the injury that was caused resulting in this chair sheath adventitial hematoma along both the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And of course, this is still that high, high attenuation contrast that's in the pericardial space there. I thought it, when I looked at this, I was wondering if this was a little connection here, but I think this is just the right atrial appendage that happens to abut the aorta here. But um, this is the first time I've seen like an actual shared sheath hematoma from an iatrogenic cause like this. So I thought this was a pretty right, interesting yeah, case. That's pretty so pressure injection yeah. of contrast medium through a catheter that was embedded in the wall of the aorta started that yeah. off. Yeah. So, and they, the, the guy was hemodynamically stable. I don't think they had to go to surgery or anything. And even on this non-gated study, you could see all the, the, just the artifact from the, from the stents, but he does have a little bit of filling of his, posterior descending coronary artery here, PDA, and his distal RCA beyond the stents. But yeah, just the first time I've seen contrast accumulate in that, in that shared adventitial sheath. Yeah, very impressive. And now this, yeah, this is the one. This is the one I texted Jeff about. And uh, this is a pretty interesting case. So this one happened last week or a couple weeks ago, 19 year old woman. And this was her radiographic presentation to an outside hospital. And she has a social history, which I will reveal in a moment, but she presents with, she has a long-standing history of asthma. And over the last couple of days prior to admission becomes acutely hypoxemic. And with, you know, with her oxygen sats dropping into the eighties, and you can see she has just bilateral airspace opacities, just kind of lumpy, bumpy mediastinum. Is uh, high as you'll see. There's some lymphadenopathy here. Ugh. Let's see. There we go. And so we can see that there's fairly symmetric bilateral lobular areas of ground glass opacity. There's some, and it's it's fairly diffuse. And there's a little bit of septal thickening. 
uh, and a little bit of more confluent consolidation in the lower lobes. And you can see she does have lymphadenopathy. Now, the key here is that her white blood cell count when she came in was like 15,000 with almost 40% eosinophils. And she had, over the last couple of days, she had ramped up her consumption of marijuana and she was using it in different forms, all inhalational. She was smoking marijuana leaves, but she was also using this CBD oil uh, through a vaporizer, or she was using uh, the, like vaping the CBD oil, which is a derivative. And so this was exquisitely steroid responsive. So she was immediately started on steroids for suspected acute eosinophilic pneumonia. And you'll see on her CT three days later that things have substantially improved. And within 24 hours of high-dose steroids, her symptoms had largely, you know, had substantially improved as well. She's got trace effusions now. Uh, but so this is, she was never brought just because by the time she got here after starting her on steroids, she was so much better. But so this is a, a presumed and, and almost certainly an acute eosinophilic pneumonia, which we often think about with smoking, like a change in smoking habit, but in her case was smoking of marijuana and vaping of, of this CBD. So this was a new uh, inhalational injury for me from drugs. So I don't, I don't think we've, that David or anyone else has shown one of these, have we? No, just a, uh, I, we've seen a cigarette one and I showed the progesterone one. Yeah. I wonder if it's the oil. Just, it, well, I, right. Cause yeah, the I'm CBD, the well, right. So the CBD oil can be consumed orally or it can be, you know, vaped. Uh huh. So, but uh, I mean, it's, it's some sort of acute eosinophilic pneumonia as a result of that because it certainly behaves like it. And with her eosinophilia, she meets criteria for it. Oh, absolutely. You, so, I'm just wondering, you know, like what the, what's in the oil itself? What kind of, what's the base? If it's purely right. the oil, if the, if the chemical, the mind altering chemicals are infused in it. Yeah. And so I was doing a little bit of reading about the, let me, let me go to my desktop here because I, I actually saved a paper on the, this was an old article from the Washington Post. So it's, it's cannabidiol, which is a derivative. You know, it's one of the molecules and it's supposed to, it still has therapeutic effects for nausea, refractory seizures, but doesn't have the, the, I guess the mind altering effects that the, the THC has. So because I was not very familiar with this, but it's now it's legal in, I think, 30 states or something like that, including California. So very interesting. So, well, Jeff, we can add that one to the poster. Uh, marijuana induced lung injuries. We can, yeah, we can add this one to the poster. So um, I don't know who else is on here. It's still just the three of us. OK, to yeah. showcases. So I'll keep going with a couple more. This hey, is. This is an interesting one. It was a good learning case for us. So this is a, I think, 10 month old. Yeah, that, as you can see, they have a closure device. So they had a known patent ductus arteriosus and you can see aorta, main pulmonary artery are enlarged. And this patient, at this time, the diagnosis was known. They came here, this was a preoperative radiograph. And so this was just read as PDA closure device in the expected location. Except it's not, and that's the interesting thing about this case. So one thing I will point out, and I will show you that the larger portion of this device is pointed anteriorly. And if you look at the PA view of the radiograph, you know certainly it looks like it could be in a reasonable location. But if the aorta is up here, you expect the the PDA to be right in here. And this is all in retrospect. And I'm going to actually go to this next case and come back to that because I found an appropriately positioned PDA closure device. And I will show you that on the lateral view, if you see that the, the, the wider or broader portion is supposed to be in the aorta, so it's the more posterior portion. And so if we go back to what we see in this case, that with this being abnormally oriented, it's essentially, and they knew this from echo, there was still a, a large residual shunt after they placed this. And they thought that this device had migrated. And what you'll see on the CT is that this is the CT that was done here. So here's the aorta, here's the patent ductus, and there is no, 
closure device in it. But yes. the closure device is more inferior and it's in the left pulmonary artery. So what happened here was that this thing essentially flipped or rotated 180 degrees. So instead of this posterior portion being, you know, up in the aorta back there, it was it had flipped down into the pulmonary artery. So, you know, I don't think I certainly wouldn't have recognized anything abnormal about that radiograph because we've never really we've never really thought about the orientation of these and it's so close to where you would expect it to be uh, but you know, despite this there was still filling of the pulmonary artery to the left lower lobe so it was incompletely occluding and i think this is just some dependent atelectasis from the acquisition of this study uh, but they tried to re retrieve this percutaneously and couldn't so yesterday they actually had to do a median stenotomy to it to remove this and to ligate the patent ductus so I think it's a good, just a good example of having a little bit deeper understanding of the the appearance of these can help, you know, recognize this. But again, it didn't really change anything because they knew this was malpositioned. Excellent. Wow. Thank you. Has that ever been reported before? Is like a known complication, like them? I don't. I don't know. And we were trying to figure out. We were discussing this at our congenital heart surgery conference. It's such a broad. PDA, I bet there just was very little room for, you know, for purchase of this thing. Yeah. Yeah, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of neck there in the, in the aorta. Cool. And um, finally, this case, I think you guys will really like, this is one of my, and this gets to Jonathan's, somewhat to Jonathan's paper that he recently wrote, just talking about differentiating like cysts and connective tissue disease from true honeycombing. This is a patient who's 69, so it wouldn't be a bad age for UIP, IPF. But if you look at the lungs, first of all, they have severe pulmonary hypertension. And I think that that's probably why you have a little bit of a mosaic pattern to the lungs. You have larger pulmonary arteries. First glance, you might want to say that this is just severe honeycombing in the lower lobes, except there's a few things that are abnormal. Number one, there are some areas where you have relative subpleural sparing in both lower lobes. Number two, there's really no traction bronchiectasis. And of course, you don't have to have traction for a diagnosis of, of UIP, but you can see these airways going all the way out. And, and sure, maybe they get a little dilated in some areas, but in other areas, they're just completely normal caliber in the lower lobes. And third, you can see that there's like a lot of these cysts are peribronchovascular rather than just purely subpleural. So this is a pattern that we've seen you know, numerous times in connective tissue disease patients. And this patient had a history of mixed connective tissue disease. And this is a nice one because I have, I have almost 20 years of temporal evolution of these findings. And so they haven't been on treatment since 2009, but you'll see in 2009, pretty similar appearance. You know, maybe a little bit of evolution an increase in severity, but certainly that would be unusual for UIP, IPF. And also, there's just not a lot of reticulation in the, in the, in the remainder of the lungs, that it's more like normal lung with just interface with cysts. But what's really cool is I was able to dig up a study from 2001, and you'll see here that it's now clearly an MSIP pattern and maybe little bands of organizing ammonia too. So this is, you know, I like to call this the definitely not possible UIP because you see these cysts and you're struggling. You know, it's not a possible UIP pattern. It's either UIP or it's inconsistent, whether you think it's honeycombing or not. And I think this is one, and we've had a few of these go to, to explant, and they, it turns out this is all just end stage NSIP, maybe some cysts with, from LIP. But this is the best example I have because now I have, like I said, 18 years of, of evolution of these findings. And Travis, I think that nicely fits the series, the a small series, the one from Vancouver. I think it was published in, um, oh, I don't know, mid-2000s, where they um, followed these NSIP patients out for years. And what they found is many of them, or I should say uh, several of them that they had long follow-up, started looking more like UIP. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you look at those cysts, they don't quite look like your honeycomb cysts. They're, they're just... No. Yeah, that's great to follow up. Yeah, and, and I think the background of ground glass is probably just pulmonary hypertension because they have connective tissue disease. You can see their pulmonary artery is huge, so they've got 
probably a combination of group one pulmonary arterial hypertension from a from a vast, you know, from an arteriopathy and then maybe some contribution from lung disease. But okay, so that's it for me. All right, cool. Howard, you want to show some? Okay. Great cases. Okay, did you guys see a frontal and lateral projection of the chest? Yes. Okay, so this is um, a perceptual test. You know that we often um, like to share cases in which there's subtle findings related to abnormal anatomy in certain regions, so give it a go. Um, this patient has chest pain. He may have had other symptoms, but he had symptoms sufficient to start off with chest radiography, so take a look. I'll give you a moment to see if you see pathology anywhere. Yes, I think I do. Okay, lateral projection, frontal projection? Lateral. Lateral. All right. Okay, very good. So let me just bring up a couple images here. So just as a reminder of what opacities we should see on lateral projection of the chest in the hilar region. This, of course, shows the right side where we have the right pulmonary artery in relation to bronchus intermedius. Here, this is what we have for left pulmonary artery and inferior pulmonary veins. And then I'll show one image here that I call the no opacity zone. And this is one no opacity zone that's located here, which in this person is definitely abnormal here. And then more subtly in this patient is the other no opacity zone, or at least in this area here behind the bronchus intermedius, there should only be opacity that can be accounted for by a normal left pulmonary artery. And if you think you see something abnormal here, and of course it can be subtle, and you don't see posterior wall of bronchus intermedius too, it adds up to pathology. So this here and that there. So I think I have a sagittal slab and I'll just scroll through there showing at this point, this on the right side, and now we're going to get to the subcarinal region. But the abnormal opacity that we see on the lateral pretty much is this here, but also more inferiorly. So it's the combination of this here and that there. So very abnormal. So these are very enlarged subcarinal nodes is the pathology there. And let's go for the axial, just to give you a feel that where the pathology is, which is all in there. So that's how you present it. And here's the diagnosis. So it's an unfortunate diagnosis, but a biopsy revealed metastatic melanoma. So a lot of pathology and a really bad diagnosis. But subtle findings on the lateral projection particularly and there's the pathology there. All right, a couple other cases. This is a nice case. Um, this patient had imaging for a CTPA for acute pulmonary embolism and no pulmonary embolism is present. But findings that are present uh, were not recognized. So some salient findings are if you look at the caliber of the main, but also the left and right pulmonary arteries, together with the enlarged right cardiac chambers, rather quite big, one should think something's going on, and certainly pulmonary hypertension is a consideration. And, and certainly if you just look at the lungs, uh, we don't have lung disease that could account for that. We don't have acute pulmonary embolism or pulmonary thromboembolism that might account for pulmonary hypertension. So here are the findings. Keep an eye on the superior vena cava and see that there are pulmonary veins that will go into it there. And if you look here, we see PAPVR to the superior vena cava and an association between that and sinus venosis, ASD superior sinus venosis ASD down here. 
is well appreciated. So that's what he has. He has a shunt and a uh, combination of PA, PVR, and sinus venosis defect. And I hope you guys will agree with me, because if it isn't, I'm going to be embarrassed. Sure looks like it. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. right. And you can see that his RV is just huge. Yeah. So, yeah, but just from the over circulation. And that's always a reminder to just look and see if there's an un undiagnosed shunt like that. Yep. Very good. Okay, I have two cases here that um, came to our attention in a short period of time. And I'll show you the imaging findings. Let me try and see which one I want to show first. Maybe this one, actually, of the two. So this person was symptomatic here. And you'll certainly see why. So there is a huge chest wall pathology. Left chest wall, variable in attenuation. Some areas of relatively low, some areas of relatively high attenuation. And initially, that was, it was suggested that that could be a tumor, a uh, sarcoma, perhaps. But we do have imaging from just a few days before. And of course, on that imaging, that's not there. So this developed in just a few days between the 5th and the 14th of September. So it certainly cannot be a tumor. And we also had an MR showing the absence of it as you can see there. So that's a large chest wall hematoma, acute hematoma, a lot of blood in there. And now I'm trying to remember what the etiology was thought to be. So here is some history. They didn't get a clear history of trauma. There was some forceful coughing prior to admission. Interestingly, it was on anticoagulants, but these levels were okay. So just a large chest wall hematoma. Don't know why it developed, but obviously not a sarcoma. And then last month, we had a very similar case to that, and it's this patient. So if you had a chest radiograph at the right time, the chest radiograph would look something like this alongside. And you'll see this very large extensive opacity in the right hemithorax. You can appreciate that there is a lot of chest wall abnormality associated with it. There is an interface here consistent with a pleural and or extra pleural process. Of course, that extra pleural process is this very large hematoma that you can see there. And I think I have a bigger image showing it a bit more. So very typical features of a huge hematoma with a lot of hemoglobin in it, as you can see there. This one too just developed without evident trauma. The patient has a history of SLE. They went in and they, because it was getting bigger, they found some vessels, intercostals, that they embolized. So this is post embolization on the right hand side. Here is one of the intercostal vessels that they found and embolized. But the etiology here isn't very clear either. You can see the history here history of liver transplantation, patient with SLE that suddenly got this chest pain transferred with a huge hematoma. So we had two of them in a short period of time. I don't know if the chest wall muscles like the psoas muscle is a place that you can get spontaneous trauma in the ab spontaneous uh, hemorrhage in the absence of trauma. I don't know if that's the case or not. Is it one place you can get spontaneous bleeding? Uh, Particularly if you have, um, the if you're on anticoagulants. I've seen psoas bleeds before, but you know, you wonder if because it's, I mean, it's such a frequently used muscle that it's sort of unrecognized trauma. Yeah, one would think it's very large. But yeah, I, that, I believe that's one of the places where people do bleed. Yep, so two, two cases in two months just by chance. Okay, I want to show you this one to see if you guys have seen this. So here we have these. I'll just go straight to the to the chase and I'll show you two images obtained a little while apart. So the time between these two is going to be, if I can get that back up to where it should be, which is here, and take off the sink. All right, so we have in terms of time. 
about two months between these two. And look at these lesions. So we have the solid center and we have the halo of ground grass. It's sort of the CT halo sign like that. And these things are growing. So if I recall correctly, usually we teach that in terms of tumors, one should think of vascular tumors like angiosarcoma. Choriocarcinoma, I think, is a classic one. And this patient has melanoma, and this is metastatic melanoma. So as best I remember, it's sometimes described in textbooks as sometimes occurring with metastatic melanoma, but it's the most dramatic one that I think I've ever seen. In fact, I'm not sure I've seen one like this in a patient with metastatic melanoma that I can recall. Have you guys seen lesions like this? I've seen one, and I can't remember if it was my case or if someone showed it on this webinar before. I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember if it was a melanoma or not, but um, I'll have to look. I've shown angiosarcoma because that's like you. I think you like you said, Howard. That's like the classic one to look like that. But that's this is just incredible. Dramatic. And we always, I guess, ascribe the ground glass halo to hemorrhage. I don't know if that. Yeah, says. you know, right. And we had this discussion here because Brett Elliker made the point. He's like, why would hemorrhage just stay around for months? You know, you wonder what it what it really is. What it really is, exactly. I yeah. don't know what it is. Is it, it just like local, up. yeah, local lymphatic in, involvement, but it's just, it's weird. Yeah, it's it's true. I mean, the hemorrhage, and that they would all bleed at the same time. You wonder if it's just, I mean, one of the possibilities is, and I don't, I don't have to ask a pathologist, but could there be some just, you know, sort of it recruits vessels, so there's sort of hyperperfusion to the lung around it maybe through the bronchial circulation. No, I don't know. You know, this poor guy did have recurrent metastatic melanoma to other sites. He had a biopsy proof from a, an abdominal mass. So we definitely know he's got metastatic melanoma. We don't have a biopsy of the lung, but he had this biopsy here, and that was the source of the diagnosis of recurrent and metastatic melanoma. So I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And these have grown over time, as you can see. So pretty dramatic case of kind of a target lesion in a way with the CT halo sign, I think it's called. Yeah. All right, those are my cases. All righty, let's see here. I've got a bunch. I'll see which ones we can do. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. I don't even know where to start. There's so many good ones. Um, well, this is why we're on the topic. This was a case that uh, Tan, Lucy, and Muhammad sent a while ago, um, just shared. Of This is melanoma with metastasis um, that are metastatic, but um, I'm sorry, that was redundant. Um, that, but it's hemorrhagic, but this one actually presented with hemoptysis and has hemorrhage. So you can see there's this large uh, mass in the right upper lobe. It looks like it may be involving the artery because you can see the airway next to it. And then there's all this ground glass and around it and kind of a in a, the right territory. So I suspect that's a true hemorrhagic metastasis um, that actively was bleeding. And it's a non-con, so I don't know, but it's pretty dense in there. But that was a melanoma just on while we're on the topic. All right, this is a cool case and I was waiting to get all the information. So um, this patient is a 34-year-old woman who has a history of an epithelioid sarcoma of her hand that was resected and had reconstruction and has been cancer-free for several years, um, but has had chronic pain. And then she presented to an outside hospital with um, progressive dyspnea and weakness and was found to be hypoxic at the time of presentation. So this is there, it's all um, outside imaging. Um, but we can see this CT angiogram here uh, didn't show any PE, but what it did show was a enlarged right ventricle, and there's some arguably some flattening of the septum, and the right atrium was mildly enlarged, but you can make out there is some bowing of the interventricular septum. So findings consistent with pulmonary hypertension. The main pulmonary artery is mildly, modestly enlarged. Um, and here's a different CT, but just from five days later, but it has a it better shows the lungs, and I'll I'll make some nips in a second. But if you look at her lungs, I think you can start to see there's a little, there's a bunch of little dots 
that aren't vessels, but tiny little almost miliary type nodules, but not quite randomly distributed. We don't see them along the pleural surfaces, along the fissures. Now I'm going to switch over to the MIPS here. Let's thicken this up a little bit to about eight. And as I scroll, you can see there's all these just tiny little nodules in the background. So, um, you know, the, initially the, the, um, the thought was, could this be a, you know, pulmonary tumor embolism syndrome, of sort of a microtumor embolism syndrome, where you, you just um, develop diffuse intravascular metastases that can lead to pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so she underwent a bronchoscopy and a transbronchial biopsy, and there was no um, tumor seen, but what was seen, um, here's the report, um, was this, and sorry it's so small, but uh, I had to paste it. Fragments of elevated lung parenchyma with numerous intravascular and interstitial foreign body type granulomas containing large birefringent crystals and eosinophils. So our pathologist says this is pretty much injection. Uh, there's really no differential for it, injected foreign bodies. And so she adamantly denied any IV drug use, but if you, she takes 120 pain pills, she gets narcotics a month and has had worsening issues with that. Um, and interesting, has a history of being a nurse. So it kind of makes you wonder if it's a sort of a, whether it's drug abuse or if it's a sort of a, a Munchausen type type thing, but um, interesting, but there's really no other explanation for it other than excipient lung disease. And so I'm going to try to get some of the path images because I think it'd be really cool to see. Okay. Um, so this is a case I sent some of you, but I think it's worth looking at again of a patient who has asbestos exposure and has really exuberant. I know David isn't here, but he gave a nice description of it. And I'll try to rehash what he said. Uh, uh, these exuberant pleural plaques, and you can see um, them on both sides, but Along with the plaque, I would argue you're probably getting into the realm of diffuse pleural thickening. Uh, these are nice plaques, sort of looks like the mesas uh, lifted up, but then you've got this denser band. And you'll notice some of the hyaline or plaque tissue sort of pushes itself into the extra pleural fat quite a bit. And then what we noticed, and I'd never seen before, and my colleague Chris Meyer, who's been doing a lot of occupational work over his career, has said he's seen it one time and it was an isolated one raised enough concern that they they actually biopsied one years ago, um, is this remodeling of the rib. You see this plaque extending into the extra pleural space and causing this pressure erosion of the rib. Now, the good news is we have a whole bunch of these here, and you can see there's one posteriorly on the right. So this is not typical, would not be typical of a malignancy, but rather just the pressure erosions. Now, why does this not happen, even though we see plenty of plaques? Well, the other observation to make is there's a lot of parenchymal bands and these sort of curvilinear bands adherent to these plaques and these little sh kind of lines coming out of it. And they've been described in the literature, mostly um, from Britain, as hairy plaques. And to me, what's happening is most of the time the parietal plaques sit on the parietal, I mean, the pleural plaques sit on the parietal surface and leave the visceral pleura alone. But in some cases, and especially when you get pleural thickening, the visceral pleura becomes involved and you get what I like to call tethering of the adjacent lung, sort of like what we see uh, along the spectrum of trapped lung with someone who's had a, some kind of pleural inflammation or, or tumor. And because of this, I would not be surprised if this caused some restriction uh, and fixation of the lung. And so because the, the lung isn't moving freely, as the plaques were growing, they took the path of least resistance and slowly pushed outwards into the extra pleural fat and cause this erosion. So yeah, it's, it's really cool to see this. Um, this isn't asbestosis, this is not fibrosis, but purely just tethering of the lung. And they're typically referred to as parenchymal bands and they, they usually point towards the hilum. Now, as luck would have it, I was re, re, uh, scoring a bunch of cases um, as part of an epidemiologic pro project thing um, from Libby, Montana. And this is another patient who was exposed to asbestos, not occupationally, but environmentally. And also, let me get the right window here, has these exuberant plaques. Now, you notice there's no pleural thickening in this case. There's extra pleural fat, but these, some of these plaques are quite large. But I did find, and I hope I remember where it was, there was another little micro erosion or pressure remodeling, probably a better term, of one of these plaques. I'll see if I can find it. 
I may have missed it already. But um, anyway, I, is, now that I've seen it once, uh, right here, left anterior. See that right there, that little divot? Same phenomenon. So uh, very interesting. I'm going to look for it a little bit more often because um, we do see quite a bit of plaque in this Libby cohort. Um, so I'd be curious to see how often that we do and see we do see that. Okay, um, here's another pair of cases that came back to back. Um, and both of these patients um, had radiation therapy. This is a 56-year-old female who had breast cancer, had a, a surgery uh, and radiation. And this was a, a radiograph back in 2016. And you can see there's clearly an abnormality of the chest wall. There's some calcification or ossification. And these bones look a little irregular. And so um, this is a, a CT from just a few days before that. And at the time, she was having a lot of pain. And you can see there's all of this um, bone formation. There's even gas in there, a lot of soft tissue swelling around there. But this just extensive ossification with this dense bone bridging multiple ribs. So that can cause fixation and um, it can rub and move uh, intercostal nerves. So she was having pain. So they went in and actually resected it. Uh, this was all radiation osteitis. Um, and then this is um, one of the compl so one of the complications of radiation. And what happens is the, the, the bone doesn't ever heal properly. Interesting also, if you look at her first rib cartilage, it's very hypertrophic and, and quite, quite extensive. Now she came back. Um, I, I didn't load her new scan because it just shows the chest wall resection in this area is there. She's still having pain in that area. And so it's really hard to figure out what to do. But probably there's involvement of intercostal nerves from all this scar tissue. Um, so that's one case. And then next day, I see another case. This patient had a lung cancer. And so if we go back to April, uh, you can see there was um, this, this mass in the right upper lobe that had been radiated. Um, and let's see, what the, whoops. there we go. And at that time you can see there's some soft tissue thickening in the, uh, extra pleural, pleural area. And also maybe a little bit on the outside of the ribs. And there's this little loosened area in there. And so of course, you know, you could think about a metastasis, but this is right in the treatment field. And there's the same thing going on with the rib above it and even may, right down there as well. So it looks more radiation because it's, it's involving a couple ribs right in the same area. And so we did a follow-up of that um, just as part of the routine follow-up. Um, and you can see that now there's a pathologic fracture through that couple of these ribs, subacute, more acute there. Um, and then you get sort of more osteolysis out laterally on these lower ribs. So, um, and then another fracture. So this is, these are two cases of radiation induced osteitis. One, causing exuberant um, callus or periosteal new bone, in this case, causing osteolysis and uh, pathologic fractures. Now, the risk factors, of course, are dose and how much of the chest wall is involved, but also um, more peripheral tumors tend to be close because they're closer to the chest wall, they're more likely to get a higher dose to the ribs. With Because with the SBRT now, if the lesion's more central, the isodose lines fall off fairly, fairly early. Um, as you get towards the chest wall. But this is something I always look for in our radiation therapy patients. And I've started specifically documenting my reports that there's no radiation induced fractures. Just remind myself to look for them because every so often you'll get a call from clinic and they'll say the patient has pain at a certain point and you go back and look and there's a subtle rib fracture there. So something to always look for and you know can allay any fears of chest wall recurrence or something like that. And it's usually from just uh, radiation osteitis. All right, this is a 42-year-old uh, IV drug user who presented quite ill. Uh, here's the chest radiograph, um, and you can see there's a bunch of nodules in the lung periphery. So uh, good look for septic emboli, and yes, we have really nice multiple, some small nodules. You wonder if there's some excipient lung disease involved or if this is just all septic emboli, but a nice look at a septic infarct where it's sort of shaggy looking but peripheral with a low attenuation but non-necrotic center. And uh, the real exciting part why I'm showing this is two things. Um, first, if we look in the uh, on the contrast portion, if you look at the pulmonic valve, there's this large mass, probably yeah. the largest vegetation I've ever seen. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. So there's that, and then um, you know, just to make a good case a little bit better, I think this right up here, 
in his uh, vein, you can see this little metal fragment there. Um, so apparently his needle broke off when he was injecting himself, and that's a needle fragment sitting in there, or a little small piece of it. Yeah, so... The pulmonic valve, wow. Yeah, that's, that one was, that was pretty cool. That's the biggest, oh my word. Yeah, let's see what else I got here. Um, This is kind of um, interesting. So this is a guy with a history of lymphoma, diffuse large B cell. Uh, he's very tall, so he doesn't quite fit on the radiograph. But you can see he's got this, board of these weird densities in his lungs, sort of along the, they're following the bronchovascular bundles. You know, this looks more mass-like, but in the lower lobes, it looks more like aspiration, maybe some consolidation, but you can clearly track it along the hilum. There's thickening posteriorly. Uh, so of course, infection, and then, you know, I'd have to think about lymphoma. And we don't see much lymphoma in the lungs, um, but if you look at the CT, you've got, let me make it a little bigger, there we go, you've got some septal lines um, and sort of a perilymphatic distribution of nodules clustering together, but very asymmetric. If you look at the fissure, it's thickened and very nodular. Um, and then there's narrowing at the hilum, and then he's got other things on the other side. But, you know, if you had the symmetric case like this, uh, you know, it'd be a very strange form of sarcoid, but then he's got this big mass down here. So clearly not a good look for sarcoid, very necrotic in some areas. Um, so this is all recurrent lymphoma, but it's all, you know, there's mediastinal involvement, but extensive pulmonary involvement from diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And one important observation is you'll see the airways, uh, arteries are preserved, which is typical. The airway does get taken out because it's big enough, but um, it's just kind of crazy. I don't, I don't see much lymphoma in the lungs, so that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and this is just another interesting case. This is a patient who had a 50-year-old who had had a uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant for, a I believe it was a leukemia, presented with cough and fever and comes in with a chest radiograph that looks like this. There's sort of this nodular consolidation and a background abnormality. So you'd expect ground glass, maybe some septal lines on CT. That you see there's no effusion or anything like that. Uh, here's the CT from... Uh, outside. And he's got a background of emphysema, which can confound the radiographic findings, but we do see these sort of nodules. Um, but the, also, if you look at some of the areas, you've got these perilobular bands of mix of consolidation ground glass. So I think if you subtract the um, emphysema, you've got a good look for an organizing pneumonia pattern, peribronchial uh, right here. And then on the left, you've got this lobby, the arcading along there and nicer arcades down low. So a nice organizing pneumonia pattern of injury, and of course this could be infection, but it's pretty symmetric and quite extensive. Um, and so the other thing to always think about is this is an excellent uh, drug reaction, but an excellent look for acute graft versus host disease. And this is what this was. Um, he had a bronch and it ruled out infection, and he had some other signs of acute GVHD in his skin and whatnot. Uh, we, they, we see a lot of chronic graft versus host disease manifesting as air trapping as the most common finding, but acute is less common and always have, it always, it always, I was telling my residents, it pretty much looks like infection and drug toxicity. So you have to include that if appropriate. So nice example. And this is after stem cell transplantation? Yes. So this is, yeah, acute GVHD. Um, okay. And just a companion case. This is a 75 year old male who has a history of, and it has a pretty radiograph of rheumatoid arthritis and presents short of breath. And you can see um, we've got this sort of peripheral consolidation distribution. Um, so sort of that the classic one that we think of is this chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. But um, with this rheumatoid arthritis, we think about CTD related lung disease. And uh, so when I see peripheral consolidation, of course, I'm thinking organizing pneumonia. Uh, he had been on some drugs, but um, that didn't seem to be the issue. And you look at the CT, and it's going to show you exactly what you see on the radiograph, but this peripheral uh, multifocal consolidation, ground glass, and very discrete areas, a nice example of non-segmental involvement where it just goes right across the pulmonary fissure. Uh, it doesn't care that it's there. So another organizing pneumonia pattern. He does have some heart disease, probably explaining the pleural effusions. And then the coronal uh, doing this. But this is... Um, this would be a classic case of the, the chronic eosinophilic pneumonia based on what's written, but 
Uh, in this case, this is all organizing pneumonia from his RA and uh, they, they um, the rheumatology, that's what they determined was his cause. And so they have to uh, find some alternative drugs to, to manage that. Okay, um, let's see, I can show this one last real quickly here. Um, this was a case given to me by one of my colleagues. This is a, a, a young child, a neonate. Uh, I think it's a neonate. Let me see if I remember how young it was. Um, th I'm sorry, three years old. Yeah, it looked a little too big to be a neonate. Three years old who had an abnormal echo and has um, a left SVC, which is not opacified, but you can sort of quasi follow it down. But big coronary sinus to me is always a tip off that there might be one, but you can see it hiding here. But that's not the reason I'm showing it. I want to show the pulmonary artery anatomy. So uh, they suspected something on echo. And you can see that the um, here's the main pulmonary artery, and then here's the left pulmonary artery. Yet the right pulmonary artery comes off sort of rather than a true, it's, uh, it's almost as the bifurcation were rotated 90 degrees. So it comes off underneath it as opposed to next to it. And maybe if I do a coronal, uh, it will show it better. But this is the so-called crisscross pulmonary arteries, but I would call it a variant. Um, I am not sure. Oh, because it's a multi-phase study. Well, we'll just pick the middle one. Um, I think, yeah, so here's the here's the infundibulum pulmonary trunk, and we see that the, the right pulmonary artery comes off right there, and this continues as the left, but then loops back around. So you can imagine the normal bifurcation was rotated um, 90 degrees about that way. Whoops, about like that. So... Um, so the variant crisscross pulmonary arteries. I don't think it's of any consequence in this patient. Um, the left SVC is there, so it follows the, uh, the rule that usually you have one anomaly. There's probably a second one hiding there, even if it's non-consequential. And uh, I think I can't remember if there's an airway finding just for fun. Um, yeah, funny. Well, that was a funny right upper lobe bronchus there. Look at that. So mm. Middle lobe, lower lobe bronchus intermedius, and it looks like a single branch. Oh yeah, there it is. And there's the tracheal bronchus. So it indeed completes the rule. Yep. I hadn't even looked at the airways in this case because I was, I, yep, I was shown the, uh, the arteries and got all excited about it and forgot to look at the airways. For, but yeah, so there's the, there's the tracheal bronchus. Fun. Okay. Well, great cases, everyone. I can, Jeff, I can show one more quick yeah. eye test. Absolutely. Since we've got time. Yeah, we do. Let me just go to the control panel here. All just right, get, I'll... get through my queue here. I'll, uh, in, in Howard's style, I'll let you look at this for a, a moment before we, uh, before I describe what we see. So it's a, just a portable radiograph and you can see the patient's intubated. And this was the radiograph I saw, this is a couple months ago, and I'll pull up the side, the, the immediate prior from two days before that, just so you can see, she has known pulmonary arterial hypertension, big pulmonary arteries. But I think that uh, this is one of my, the best examples I've seen of this in a while, where if you, you guys see the abnormality. Oh, things are flashing, something wrong with us, with our new Asarix or GoTo meeting. I think flashing. I'll go to now. Is, is it still flashing? Cause I'm not doing anything. Yeah, no, it's not. Okay. I'm just trying not to move is, anything. There's a stent in the left main bronchus on that. You Well, right. You think it's a stent, but it's not. So that tells you exactly what it is. But now you're seeing an outline of the left main stem bronchus. And you may see a little bit too much of the right tracheal, or the right paratracheal uh, region. You see the right wall of the trachea. So I saw this and thought this was probably pneumomedia. Well, I, I knew it was pneumomediastinum because they hadn't done anything. And uh, they did get a CT the next day, and you'll see that it's it is indeed quite a bit of pneumomediastinum that was had developed as a result of barotrauma. So yeah, it's like the the tracheal wriggler sign with the uh, with the because it does look like a stent, but you're just nicely seeing outline of air on both sides. The double wall so, sign. Of it. Yeah. And then the yeah. Yep, and then you see the right. You can see the right tracheal wall and a little bit of the left, although that, that feeding tube obscures it. But just barotrauma with a subtle pneumomediastinum on the radiograph. Very nice. Very good. So, okay, well, that is it for me. All right, guys. Thanks. And uh, David should be Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, everyone.